Good afternoon, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Rabinovich, um, giving his swan song uh, talk today, as it were. He is a homegrown Washingtonian, having been educated and uh, here at the University of Washington and has had an illustrious 40-year uh, career here at the University of Washington as faculty. He is the vice chair of research for the department and also the leader of the Nathan Schock Center for Excellence in the Basic Biology of Aging, along with Matt Caberline. And uh, he's been studying aging for most of these 40 years uh, through the lens of the mitochondria um, and cardiovascular physiology. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Rabinovich. Thank you, Alex. So Alex has given a little bit of an introduction uh, to my title, uh, and it indeed is going to be talking about mitochondrial energetics and redox status in cardiac aging. Um, but the subtitle, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, uh, that's a hitchhiker's guide to the universe sort of um, way of, of saying it's been a great run. As Alex mentioned, it's been 40 years on the faculty and I'm going to be retiring this year. The lab has already turned over to Mariah Sweetwine. So this may be the last PowerPoint presentation on science that I give. Because of that, I'm gonna take the opportunity to put a little historical perspective on this. Um, and I'll call this the road from the early age of geroscience to the present and, and perhaps subtitled actually the road from the dark age of geroscience to the present. You'll, you'll see why I, I refer to it that way because at, at the beginning we were really um, sort of fighting our way outside of a paper bag where it was very dark inside because there really was very little molecular genetics understood. But this does go back to my work. I, I did my graduate work with Tom Norwood and George Martin. Um, and in this particular age, the state of the art there was uh, somatic cell genetics with, uh, as you see on the left, a study of heterocarians where we made heterocarians between young and old cells um, or old cells and HeLa cells. Uh, and all of that is now explained by understanding of what the uh, inhibitors of cytokines are and how those affect um, or the uh, uh, oncogenic factors that overcome those. So that, you know, th at, at this point, those are all easily explainable at the time, not so explainable. George Martin on the right slide had a great idea um, to take advantage of, of a probe that we did have for molecular molecular synthesis, uh, encephalomyocarditis, so, uh, which uh, replicates in the, in the brain and heart and other places. But the, the um, reason for doing that uh, was George's idea of, of testing the error catastrophe hypothesis in aging, which would have predicted that the molecular synthesis rates would be declining with age. And in fact, that study shows no age difference in viral replication rates, which we inferred as to show the uh, absence of support for the, uh, an error catastrophe in aging. So went on, uh, I was lucky enough after my training to join the faculty uh, and as an instructor, I've got my, my only, one and only in my lifetime sole publication uh, from work that was done in flow cytometry. And flow cytometry was something that George Martin and his program project at the time offered. This was very early years in, in, in the history of flow cytometry and uh, was able to use a new technique that is to say, uh, labeling of cells with bromodeoxyuridine followed by Herxt flow cytometry, which allowed us to look at cycling and non-cycling cells to really do a cell cycle analysis. And this was published uh, in PNAS. So I was, I was happy with this. It was innovative at the time, um, but we'll put that in perspective in a second. So the way this is done was, was serum was added to quiescent cells. And then one looked at the proportion of cells that remained in G1. And at low population doubling levels, in other words, with young cells, the cells rapidly exit from the G0-G1 phase and begin to enter into the cell cycle. And then uh, there are about 6% of them though that never get out of the cell cycle. When you get to PDL62, late passages, then 70 something percent of them are not entering the cell cycle and they do so slowly. So you can quantitate that. So with increasing population of doubling level, the non-cycling cell population goes up. So this is a really descriptive way of seeing what we now know to be senescent cells. But remember, this is 20 years before beta-galactosidase measurement or any marker of cell senescence. Um, so it's, it's uh, it, 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 more complicated way of showing this, but essentially what it's saying is the proportion of senescent cells increases uh, with population doubling level, not really a surprise. Uh, on the right, we can, from the same analysis, though, look at the rate of exit from G1. So this is the G1S transition rate, which progressively declines in time. Well, 
that was interesting, but it, these days it, you'd say this was obvious because this is exactly explained by uh, elevations in P16, which is an inhibitor of cyclin-dependent kinase, uh, and that slows the rate of, G, of exit from G1. But again, this is decades before one understood any of that. But in retrospect, <laughs> all of this makes great sense. So the flow cytometry continued to be a, a really fertile area of study, and we branched out, tried to get away from, from cells and culture. Uh, and at the time, the best way of doing that, the most amenable, accessible way, was to look at peripheral blood lymphocytes. And we actually looked at T cells uh, and did this uh, in collaboration with, um, with Carl June, uh, postdoc Angelica Grossman, and Jeff Ledbetter. Uh, Angelica and Jeff um, went on to industry. Carl June, you probably know his name, uh, because he is now a, a star in the, uh, the area of uh, CAR T cells, CAR T cells. Um, so, but this was using the DIE-INDO-1 and we're able to show very, very variation in heterogeneity in T cells in the calcium response. And Gaelica went on to do, to do work that tied this back to aging, age-related deficiency in calcium response to CD3 stimulation or concannabinol A and T cell subsets. So age-related changes could be defined that way. So we're getting a little bit more molecular here in the sense of, of it is calcium fluxes after cell stimulation. Took a sideline for a good 20 years um, because the interest in aging overlapped with the interest in flow cytometry for looking at, at early precancerous conditions of the gastrointestinal tract. So this, this resulted in publications, the first uh, one of which I'm showing here in 1989, progression to cancer in Barrett's esophagus is associated with genomic instability. So that was done by flow cytometry, looking at multiple, multiple aneuploid populations. And you'll see some great names here, Roger Haggett, Tom Norwood, again, and uh, Cy Rubin. So um, we miss them, miss them dearly, but they were great collaborators. Um, yes, the next one was uh, chromosomal instability and ulcerative colitis is related to telomere shortening. A postdoc at the time, Jacinto O'Sullivan, who is now a full professor at Trinity College in Dublin, and again, colleagues, Mary Bronner, uh, uh, Teresa Brentnall, uh, and a cast of others uh, with work that we uh, were able to publish in 2002. Uh, and more recently, um, Rosanna Risquez, who I hope is on the line, but you all know Rosanna. Ulcerative colitis is a disease of accelerated colon aging, evidence from telomere attrition and DNA damage, uh, published all the way more recently in 2008. The picture on the bottom is one of my favorite um, in that you get a really colorful presentation. This is from Jacinto Sullivan's work, and this is with double labeling of, uh, of telomeres in green and centimeres in red by PNA Fish, uh, just showing in a a mitotic figure here in interface cells for reference, but in looking in the colon, this is a normal colon. Here, here's the epithelium of a crypt. Here are the stromal cells, and both the, ep the epithelium and the stromal cells have, have green dots and red dots, and we'll call this the standard. But if you look over here at the epithelium of a patient with ulcerative colitis, you'll notice the absence of green dots in the, in the clonic epithelial cells, uh, although they're fully present in the stromal cells. So a, a pretty picture. We were able to quantitate those and use that me those measurements in, in these and other papers. Uh, I was just mentioning those names. Okay, so the real beginning of the rest of the talk though, began with this work that uh, culminated in this science publication, Extension of Murine Lifespan by Overexpression of Catalase Targeted Mitochondria. Postdoc at the time, Sam Schreiner, who's now a professor at UC Irvine, Irvine uh, Nancy Linford, and I, I think Nancy may even be on the call, and of course, George Martin. And George, is, he's a middle author here, but he, he really was the motivating factor for starting on this work. I had the, the honor of, of finishing it, uh, but George started it and um, he's being very modest with the middle of the authorship there. But you'll see catalase is, is significant here because of its detoxification of hydrogen peroxide. And it, it does it uh, uh, catalytically without any other cofactors and um, process it into benign water and oxygen. So this was made, made in transgenic mice that expressed the catalase targeted to mitochondria with a mitochondrial uh, targeting leader sequence. And we were able to show that the MCAT survival, this is the proportion of surviving cells as a function of their age and month, was increased. So the, the controls, two founder lines uh, are shown here. And this is a typical survival curve, median 
a uh, lifetime of about 25 months, which is pretty typical for black six mice. Uh, and this is extended by about 20% in both median and maximal lifespan. So there, there were no differences in body weight or litter size, fecundity was good. The mice just lived longer. This was, it became a, a pretty well cited publication. There are, are many more publications by both us and many other authors who have used this as a way to look at the influence of hydrogen peroxide um, on, uh, as you say, reactive oxygen species on a variety of phenotypes, including cancer, metabolic syndrome, sensory defects, neurodegeneration, muscle function. I'll be talking about, about heart failure and cardiac aging, and, but I'm not gonna go through all of these. And in fact, I really haven't updated this list in about 10 years, so it is much longer than this. But really, this has been a great tool for many people, and the MCAT phenotype um, it really is pervasive in a variety of conditions which are related either to aging or the kinds of, of uh, problems that, that um, occur, for instance, in neurodegenerative disease um, in aging and premature aging. So the, to put this in context, um, we, if you look at cardiac aging in people, this is work from Ed Licata's lab, you look at, at cardiac hypertrophy, so the wall thickness progressively goes up with age, and if you look at diastolic function, it progressively declines in age in both males and females. Uh, the level here of the red dotted lines uh, is where the ratio of diastolic filling in the early phase for E or the late atrial phase for A switches over. And instead of normally being a, an ejection, which is mainly uh, performed by contraction of the left ventricle, excuse me, the filling that is normally performed by relaxation of the, la of the left ventricle, instead it becomes filling from uh, an atrial contraction. And when that ratio flips, um, it is one of the indicators of diastolic dysfunction, uh, which is associated with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or hif -pif. In mice, we saw the same thing. So here's cardiac uh, hypertrophy um, measured by echocardiography, progressively increasing with age, diastolic dysfunction, progressively going down. Here's that level of one, which at, at 24 months, uh, the, the, you cross the line. And myocardial performance index is a, is a, uh, is a uh, parameter that relates to the proportion of the cardiac cycle that is not associated with a change in volume. It's the isobolemic phase. And when that goes up, it's not good. So the fact that this is rising is an indicator of reduced myocardial performance. In the MCAP mice, this is appreciably different. So this, is, this was really striking uh, in terms of the magnitude of improvement in cardiac hypertrophy, you about have the rate of increase with aging. And similarly, diastolic dysfunction, better than half, halfway restored to the youthful level and similarly with myocardial performance index. So this looked like a very profitable area to study in terms of the, the cardiac phenotype and the and MCAT. So at about the same time, I'll set the stage for, for part of what we'll be talking about later, which is the contrast between these positive results in MCAT and a variety of work, a lot of it done by Arlen Richardson and Holly Van Remen with a variety of other transgenic mice that expressed other antioxidants, which did not have the kind of effects that I've been talking to you about. And in fact, they published this paper in 2009 titled, Is the Oxidative Stress Theory of, of Aging Dead? So the Oxidative Stress Theory of Aging was proposed by, by um, by, uh, uh, by Harmon um, uh, probably 50 some odd years ago. Um, and it was highly attractive in terms of positing that the accumulation of free radical damage was responsible for aging. A variation in that was the mitochondrial free radical theory, which basically said that the same thing was happening, but the mitochondria were the source and the targets of the free radical aging. Uh, and this was partially, I mean, a good part of why of, of why the catalase was targeted to mitochondria here, I didn't mention, but if you target the catalase to the cytosol, you don't get the same effect. So there really is an advantage to putting antioxidant potential in the mitochondria. But this sort of, this sort of raised, raised the specter of the possibility that this attractive and simple theory was wrong. And what it really requires is the proper context and interpretation, which we will progressively get to, I hope, as this talk goes on. So we wanted to do something that was more translational than the MCAT. Obviously, 
but one isn't going to be able to give a human therapy based on transgenesis, at least not today, not then, and, and maybe not for a long time. But a pharmacologic compound uh, that was originally called SS31, has more recently been generically named elamipratide, is a tetrapeptide, originally thought to be an antioxidant, because it, there, in the left side, you can see that it, it does seem to, to have some protective effect from tert butyl hydrogen peroxide. Um, but its, its structure is here, it's a tetrapeptide. And it is, this figure shows that it is targeted to, to mitochondria. It's now known that the targeting is due to its high affinity for cardiolipin. So in the early studies, what we thought was that, that we, sh we didn't have time to wait for, for giving this to mice in a young age and get to an old age. Um, so we compared the MCAT effects in an acute model of heart failure to the effects of the SS31 in four weeks of that same acute model. model. So this is done with transverse aortic constriction. We did exactly parallel studies with angiotensin II induced hypertrophy and the results were the same. That is to say, in looking at things like organ weight, cardiac hypertrophy is substantially reduced by MCAT, fractional shortening, that is reduced in, 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 uh, in the TAC model is restored partially. But if you look at the SS31, it's not only the same, it's actually even more striking. The SS31 was more effective in reducing, uh, preventing uh, cardiac hypertrophy and in, and in allowing the fractional shortening uh, uh, evidence of cardiac failure to be almost completely attenuated. So this was, this was really great, but it's not exactly aging. What changed the landscape on this was observations done by uh, Mike Stiegel, a postdoc, uh, actually a graduate student working with Dave Marcinek. Their pictures are on the left. Dave Marcinek has been a longtime collaborator, but the really intriguing part of this was that Mike and Dave had the odd idea, odd at the time, to see what would happen with SS31 given acutely. So this is just one hour treatment given to to, uh, to, to, to mice looking at skeletal muscle function. And they're able to measure the maximum rate of ATP production, um, which in old animals was reduced, but one hour of SS31 improved that. The P to O ratios, which is the, the amount of high energy phosphate you get per oxygen consumed, goes down with aging and is restored. If you actually look at muscle contractility and the, uh, and the plateau here is, a, is evidence of um, fatigue. So the fatigue level in, in the old controls is actually improved. That is to say, it, you get uh, a, a, a larger fraction of the resting forces maintained. And glutathione, I'll get to this later, glutathione redox ratio is restored. And we'll be coming back to that. But these were really intriguing and, and important observations uh, done almost a decade ago. But it changed the direction of our work because this said now we didn't have to do lifelong treatment with either MCAT or SS31. So the question was, let's compare those two short duration versus, versus lifelong. And the key here is that the simplest version of the free radical theory of aging would not have predicted that short-term treatment would reverse the effects of lifelong exposure to ROS. So this is why it was counterintuitive. And in fact, and this is work done by Ann Chow, who is, uh, who is here on the Zoom. Hello, Ann. And uh, Ann was, was able to look at old, old mice uh, and measure diastolic function after four to, or eight weeks of SS31. The SS31 is delivered by osmotic mini pump, it is, not, it is not a compound that can be delivered orally because it's rapidly di uh, digested by, um, by peptid peptidases in the uh, GI tract. But if you give it by osmotic mini pump, then you can see that the diastolic function, which normally is down here at about one, rises up close to the youthful level, which is here in the dotted line, um, and does so progressively from four to eight weeks. The myocardial performance index, um, uh, which uh, is up here in the old animals, drops down towards the youthful levels. So that other that parameter is also greatly improved at, at, at eight weeks. Just as, as we found with the MCAT, not much function, not much help with the fractional shortening, but heart weight, that is to say cardiac hypertrophy, um, is reversed in this case by, um, uh, by treatment with SS31 in just eight weeks. So this this was really exciting uh, in the sense of this was a therapy that was given in old age, 24 months, 
uh, the equivalent of about 70 year olds uh, and extended for uh, four to eight weeks after that had a profound effect on reversing uh, cardiac dysfunction. Turned out um, we were able to do the same thing. And this is uh, Ellen Quarles, a graduate student at the time. And, and Ellen is on board. Hello, Ellen. Uh, was able to look at MCAT delivered by adeno-associated virus. And the same thing, that is to say, in this case, in 12 weeks, one got a substantial improvement in diastolic function uh, using the adeno-associated viral transduction. So um, that recapitulates the fact that treatments in old age can reverse this phenotype uh, by either uh, MCAT or the SS31 uh, elamipratide. So it's not all good news. In fact, the, it's if you're young, it turns out that you wouldn't want to be uh, be expressing catalase in your mitochondria. And this is work done by Nate Basisti, who's also here, and Mike McCoss, who's been a longtime collaborator in proteomics. So this was done uh, in a proteomic study, and we looked at 379 proteins that were significantly changed in the heart with age. Um, and of those 379, um, the age-related change averaged to be five-fold. So, and that's in the black line here. So this is the, the five-fold increase between young and old. And what we wanted to see in the old was the case, that is to say that, that, that MCAT expression um, Turned, turned the clock back on those and the MCAP became much, much closer to the young. So you see, instead of here, we're down here, uh, just as good as the young animals. What we were surprised at though, in fact, we had to do the experiment a number of times. The initial study showed that the young animals had a, had a proteome that was more similar in abundance levels to the old, which was really puzzling. And in fact, we thought we'd mixed up the samples and we did it again. And we finally did a, did a third time with a larger sample set and that's what's shown here. And they're all reproducible. If you give the MCAT to a young animal, the proteome looks like, an, like it's older. So this is really an aspect of what's called antagonistic pleiotropy. That is to say what's good for the old animal could be bad for the, for the young. Uh, and that's because this is a balance and this is now better understood. Um, and this work contributes to that understanding that, that, that ROS is a balance between cell signaling and ROS-based signaling is important to cells versus damage and ROS-based damage obviously is not good. So old in MCAT, you take what is in a suboptimal environment with a high level of ROS and oxidative damage and you reduce that to the more youthful level where you get optimal retox signaling and, and proteostasis. But if you give the MCAT to the young level, you're now re reducing redox signaling in the redox environment to a suboptimal level. So this actually makes, makes pretty good sense um, and really shows one of the caveats with, um, with the kind of work with antioxidants, which is that they have to be given in the right way in the right context so as to not interfere with normal signaling processes. So uh, Anne went on and looked at a number of factors. Just I don't want you to think that it was, there was all echocardiography because there's a lot of biochemistry involved. So th this work published uh, also in, in 2020 in her eLife publication uh, shows changes in cardiac AMP activation. So eight-week treatment uh, activates uh, uh, phosphotyrosine 172 in AMP kinase. Um, also the same thing as serine 485. This one, this one is, is uh, excitatory, this is inhibitory. So they both go in the direction you'd expect to make a more youthful activity of AMP kinase. Um, if you look at LC3 to one ratio, which is a measure of autophagy, autophagy is, uh, is, is improved. That is to say this ratio goes down when gets, gets improved, um, improved levels of autophagy with uh, treatment. And the proportion of senescent cells judged by P16 and Mariah Sweetwine uh, helped with this P16 measurement uh, goes down. It's only slight. There's, there aren't that many P16 positive cells in, in the heart, but it does significantly go down with SS31. Um, and also showed that a, that a number of age-related phosphomodulation of contractile apparatus could be an, an explanation for what's going on in the improvement uh, in cardiac stiffness, actually the reduction in stiffness. So this is uh, MYB PC2, um, an important mediator of stiffness, troponin-1, uh, uh, 
phosphorylation and also tightened. So each of these, as well as, as the protein XIRP1, each of these is changing the direction which will, will promote relaxation or reduce stiffness of the uh, cardiac contractile apparatus. So a good explanation for what's, what's happening here in terms of the uh, effect on phosphomodulation of those proteins. So continuing with, with the proteomics and, and looking at, at aspects of the proteome, um, Jeremy Whitson, who, who is also on, uh, on the Zoom, hello, Jeremy, um, worked again with Mike McCoss uh, and, uh, and collaborators looking at protein thioredox state uh, of the old cells. And, uh, and here, I, I think you can see just in terms of, of, a, um, of a heat map, um, this is one of the most dramatic heat maps that, that we've actually seen or that you, you may see in the sense of on this row adjusted coloring, the old is extreme relative to the young and the old SS31 is intermediate and the color changes are extremely uniform. That is to say, these are among the most uniform changes across the proteome that we have seen in, in any treatment or any parameter. The average levels as histograms are shown here. The old level of glutathionalization uh, is up here in the blue levels. And um, uh, as a comparison, this is the relative ratio of thiolation uh, of young to old. And so there's uh, a lot more in the uh, old controls. And if the old, the old SS31 treated uh, goes to a much closer to, uh, to a ratio uh, which, is, uh, which is reduced here. So, uh, so this, this was part of a, of a paper that uh, was published age, uh, elamipertide attenuates age associated post translational modifications of heart proteins. Great work by Jeremy. So, we really start to, to zero in on another really interesting change with work that was done by, with, by Ann Chow working closely with Hui Long Zhang. Hui Long is also on board. Hello, Hui Long. Um, and this was looking at, um, at the seahorse assay uh, and looking at oxygen consumption rate. And if you've seen seahorse assays, they look like this. There's a, 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 there's a basal level of oxygen consumption. You then treat with oligomycin A and what's left over is a protein is a proton leak. If you treat with the, the decoupling agent FCCP, you get the maximal rate, rate of, of uh, oxygen consumption here. But the differences between the young and the old and the old treated, which is in, in green, are here in the basal level on the proton leak. And this difference between young and old uh, in eight weeks of treatment is whoops, I didn't mean to do that, is uh, completely reversed back to the younger phenotype. And all of that, almost all of that, uh, is due to the proton leak. So this is actually what's responsible. This proton leak is what's responsible for the age-related difference here in the eight-week treatment. And in one hour of treatment of cardiomyocytes, um, one gets a similar result. It is somewhat intermediate, as you can see here, to the eight-week level, but th it, it, it is highly significant. So Hui Long went on to do something which was really very clever here to, to look at this, this proton leak. And what he did was he took old cardiomyocytes, transduced them with a mitochondrial targeted CPYFP. CPYFP is a fluorescent protein that is a pH indicator. That's to say its, P, its spectral characteristics change with pH. Here at pH 7.5, you can see that it's bright green, and at pH 5.3, it's much dimmer. And, and uh, you look at the ratio of 488 to 405, uh, and that actually is, the, uh, is the, uh, the parameter that is most indicative of the pH. So young cells in black, if you take, take those, those, those cardiomyocytes and you, and you permeabilize them with saponin, the pH on the outside becomes the same as the pH on, in the cytosol. And if you change the pH on the outside from 7.3 or then change that medium to 6.9 or 5.3, then the, uh, the pH is relatively preserved from the baseline. So it's, it's relatively constant. It goes down a little bit at 5.3, but it crashes once you get to 4.5. In contrast, the old cells have are unable to maintain that pH gradient and it progressively declines. Even at pH 7.3 is reduced, reduced further at 6.9, reduced further and essentially crashes it at 5.3. If you treat those cells 
for one hour with SS31 before this treatment, then you get a, com a complete restoration of this phenotype to the, that of the young cells. So remember, there are no mitochondrial energy substrates here. These are with cells in which the, the, they're essentially, they're dead at this point. And what we're really looking at is a property of the mitochondrial membrane and its capacity to maintain a pH gradient. So this was, this was really an, an intriguing insight into what might be going on with what SS31 is doing in this cardiolipin membrane. And the, the diagram here shows, uh, shows components of, uh, of uh, the oxidative phos uh, oxphos um, uh, electron transport chain. Um, here, here's, the, here's lipid and obviously ATP synthase and ANT1 uh, are the ones that are relevant here for proton transfer. Um, uh, the proton, proton gradient normally drives ATP production, but it can also leak either through ANT1 as a constitutive leak or regulated leak through, through uncoupling proteins, UCP2 uh, being the major one in the heart. And one can now look at inhibitors of these. One can inhibit with the ANT1 with boncretic acid um, or carboxytractylicide, and both of these interact with the central pore of, of ANT1, the translocase pore, um, or you can inhibit ATP production with oligomycin or, or UCP2 activity with gen genepin. So uh, Hui Long did exactly each of these, looking at this ratio at pH 5.3. So at pH 5.3, the control pH gradient is not maintained, and that's shown by this reduction here. But the gradient is preserved. Uh, the pH inside the mitochondria is preserved uh, if, you, if you treat them with boncretic acid or carboxyatraclicide. Um, but not with so much with genepin and not at all with oligomycin A. And the rate of the rate of the proton leak uh, is also inhibited by boncretic acid uh, carboxyatraclicide, but not genepin or, or uh, oligomycin. So, so the boncretic acid and carboxyatraclicide are doing the same thing as the SS31 in terms of of preventing the proton leak. And here the mechanism for each of those is well understood in terms of, of these having a, a, their physical presence in the, in the pore um, uh, normally blocks the activity of the translocase, but here it's blocking the, the proton leak. So the idea that, that, uh, that SS31 may actually be interacting um, with key elements of the, of the apparatus of these protons that are in the inner membrane was really um, uh, created an insight by a study that was done by uh, Dave Marcinek and Jim Bruce. Um, and this is, this is looking at, uh, at what, what Jim calls the, the interactome. So SS31 was looked at in terms of the, of the mitochondrial protein interacting landscape by taking biotinylated SS31 cross-linking it in the cells and then looking at mass spec and seeing what proteins were, uh, were biotinylated uh, and uh, pulled down with the cross-linking. And, uh, and they showed a number of these, but critical, meant most of them actually being in the electron transport chain uh, or in portions of the TCA cycle. But the one that I want to point out here is, is ANT1. And the site of interaction uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the cross-linked species here was uh, in green. Uh, the predicted uh, predicted range of biotinylated SS31 positions is shown in dark blue. Uh, and these are these are in the middle of the protein. This is this is looking head on, this is looking sideways. And here the SS31 is predicted to be in the pore by this in interaction landscape. Uh, so that really suggested that the that it was a direct interaction. Hui Long went on to do exactly, or at least in parallel to this. They were, it was, they were both, these studies were done at about the same time and published close to, to the same time. SS, uh, so what Hui Long did was a pull down with biotinylated SS31. So, so you, you take S30, SS31 with biotin linked to it, you look at what may be a protein target and you pull it down on, on streptavid and resin. So, and here's, here's what happens. Here's the pull down. 
uh, with a Western blot for ANT1, you can see that ANT1 is indeed pulled down. But if you put in 10 micromolar or 50 micromolar SS31, it completely it competes with this pull down. So you no longer, this is, this is unlabeled SS31. So the unlabeled SS31 competes with the biotinylated SS31 for this pull down. Bone chloritic acid and, and carboxyatraculocyte partially compete. Genopen or oligomycin A do not compete at all. So um, this really, together with the, with the, the mass spec interaction landscape, uh, does strongly suggest that the, that the SS31 is interacting with the ANT1 to explain uh, its effect on uh, preventing the proton leak through ANT1. So where this will go is now, now that we know that the greatest effect of SS31 is on s glutathionization and, and, and that, that in that study, three cysteine sites, whoops, did it again, three cysteine sites in ANT1 showed up. Um, so actually the strategy here is to take those cysteines and target them by introducing uh, a point mutation to remove the cysteines uh, and do that in WTC uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cells, work in collaboration with Julie Mathau at Ice Cream, um, then differentiate the cardiomyocytes, look at induction of senescence and testing the NT1 proton leak. So this work is, uh, is ongoing in a collaboration between uh, Julie and Hui Long, uh, and I'm anxiously awaiting what those results are. The, the hypothesis here is that by, by changing the the about the, these cysteines and preventing their escalate finalization, um, then we will prevent the, in, the altered environment in aging from changing the, the ANT1 characteristics. So the summary so far, I think I'm doing okay on time. The summary so far is that SS31, which was serendipitously, really, I didn't mention this, it was accidentally discovered as a mitochondrial targeted antioxidant and Hazel Zito at the time had no idea that she was gonna end up looking at either something that was mitochondrial targeted or an antioxidant or in any way interacted with, with mitochondrial energetics. Uh, but uh, it eventually was shown to be cardiolipin targeted and interact with intermembrane proteins and, and improves ATP production, work done by, Mike, uh, by Dave Marcinek and reduces ROS. The mechanism of action includes blocking an age-related proton leak through ANT1. It improves cardiac function and exercise performance in old mice. And some of the mechanisms include AMPK activation, redox changes, and, and changes in phosphorylation status, uh, post-translational modifications of contractile proteins. We'll take a final diversion away from SS31 onto another mitochondrial targeted agent, nicotinamide mononucleotide, work done by Jeremy Whitson. Jeremy's joined us. Uh, Jeremy is, is on the faculty at Davidson College now, um, and uh, it, uh, Jeremy published this work, Differential Mechanisms of Effect of Mitochondrial Drugs on the Aged Mouse Heart. What he did was that he compared the effects of SS31 or, NM, or NMN or both uh, given to, to, uh, to mice either by osmotic mini pump for SS31 or in the water with NMN, or for both of them, the mice that got an osmotic mini pump also got NMN in the water, and then wait eight weeks and look at the effects. If you look at diastolic function, as I showed you before, the SS31 improves diastolic function, but the NMN does not. If you give both of them, then you do get the improvement in, in diastolic function, presumably conferred by SS31. If you look at systolic function, and this is done at a higher workload, that's to say you, you really only get an, a, can see a, a, an effect here in, in, although it's called higher work here, under echocardiography, um, when, re, when normally it gets a reduction in the heart rate from the anesthesia. Uh, but if you give dopamine, dopamine uh, dobutamine, excuse me, if you give dobutamine, then you can restore those to a, a normal, about 600 beats per minute is normal in a mouse. So if you do this uh, under the higher workload, you can see that, that, the, that the reduced uh, fractional shortening in the old animals is restored by NMN, but not so much, uh, not significantly by SS31. And again, with both, you get the improvement. So the conclusion here is that if you want to get both an improvement in diastolic function and systolic function, you need both. So this is a good example of, of um, multiple drugs um, delivered for, for either additive or synergistic effects uh, with an endpoint on improved uh, health span in aging. 
Jeremy uh, has looked, uh, gone on to look at protein acetylation with age. Um, and it's a modest effect, but I think you can see it. This is the, the difference between young and old controls. This is the young, these are the old controls. So, so they're contrasted in the degree of protein acetylation uh, between the red and the blue. And the, the old or the NMN treatment, I think just in terms of overall gestalt, you can see that these are somewhat paler blue. It doesn't by any means look like the, the dramatic effect that the glutathionalization had, the, the, the thiolate thioproteome, but it, but it is an observable effect here just by color. And this is quantitated. And if you look at proteins with increased acetylation with age, they are increased here in the old, not an SS31 effect, but the proteins that have increased acetylation with age are, are, have, are restored partially to the young level here uh, uh, to, um, in the reduced fashion. And, and one expects this in terms of the augmentation of, of histone deacetylases um, by NMN. Um, proteins with decreased acetylation with age shown here are partially reversed by both SS31 and NMN. So a more subtle effect uh, on, the, on acetylation. But really the picture with everything that we've looked at is that post-translational modification affects uh, of, the, of what we think of originally as, as antioxidants, but are just really redox modifying interventions uh, have profound effects. And, and we can see them not only on abundance, but on the level of post-translational modifications. So the summary here is that SS31 prevents age-related proton leak uh, through ANT1, restores diastolic function, repairs age-related oxidation, that is to say, uh, redox status of the proteome, and rescues age-related phosphomodulation of contractile elements. It restores high work systolic function in old heart, reverses age-related uh, increases in acetylation, and if combined SS31, uh, uh, the NMN, and SS31 uh, rescue age-related loss in NAD levels. I didn't show this data. Given in tandem, they have a better, bigger benefit than both alone. But the bigger picture here is that aging changes in redox-regulated systems are much more than simply looking at ROS. And it's much more than just thinking of ROS as, as producing macromolecular damage. Um, redox-regulated systems have much more profound but also more complicated effects. This is sort of summarized in this cartoon, um, which is still uh, this, this cartoon, which, which we published with Dao Fu Dai in 2012. I've, I've modified this slightly, but it is, is still very pertinent. We're, we're showing schematically a mitochondria here. The redox coupled systems are pervasive. That is to say they're at the level of NAD and sirtuins and the, and the mitochondrial protein, uh, the MPTP, the, the, the permeability transition pore, uh, as well as the NAD, NAD, pH redox regulation uh, and, and, the, and glutathione, which are important for, for redox regulation and, and are important cofactors in antioxidants. Not so much MCAT, which doesn't need a cofactor, but MCAT is, is right here together with other antioxidants uh, in protecting there. The SS31 we think is having its primary effect on the electron transport chain and, S and, and the ANT1. I didn't mention, but the proton leak also has a direct effect on uh, opening of the mitochondrial permeability transition pore and the SS31 treatment by blocking that can, can be shown to stabilize, the way long is shown, stabilizes the MPTP. So the whole system is one of redox regulated, ROS mediated or redox regulated signaling uh, for uh, cardiac uh, health. So this picture still works uh, after this many years, but compared to 40 years ago, it's, it's at a level of complexity that we, we never could have understood uh, working, working inside that dark paper bag 40 years ago. Uh, it's still complicated and you know, the cell biology just gets more and more complicated uh, as one gets to a, a point where it takes a lot of, of interact, interacting signalings and interacting changes, translational, post-translational, um, uh, just a whole network. Uh, and appreciating that is a real challenge to keep people going for many more years beyond this. In fact, the future work here is going to be to use SS31, NMN, and other mitochondrial targeted agents, of which there's a good handful, to determine the mechanisms of age-related mitochondrial dysfunction and the best ways to target to correct that. And that work is being continued by Dave Marcinek and, and Jim Bruce in skeletal muscle. 
and in kidney glomeruli and tubules by Mariah Sweetwine and Charlie Alpers, and in using very clever microbiophysics and reduction of systems as say some, some of them being cell-free systems, collaborating with Nathan Alder at the University of Connecticut. So finally, acknowledgements, obviously a lot of people, and I've, I've mentioned a good number of them, uh, colleagues here at the university and, um, uh, and former lab members, many of whom are actually on the line and the, the majority of them have gone on to their own independent, uh, independent careers on faculty. Uh, Jeannie Fredrickson, I didn't mention, Jeannie had, had been uh, for many, many years uh, the, the, the lab manager is now doing the same thing for Rosanna and indispensable to these kinds of studies. SS31 was provided by Stealth Biotherapeutics, but principal funding was from, uh, from the Ellison Foundation and AFAR and the Glenn Foundation and AFAR, and uh, mainly a, a, a program project grant um, in, from aging with this number, 1751 is a really low number. And this is because George Martin started this uh, over 40 years ago and I was lucky enough to inherit it. Uh, similarly, George, George started the T32 um, uh, and actually that number is wrong, but it's also a low number. Uh, and uh, many of these trainees were supported on the aging training grant, which is now being carried on by Matt Caberline. So with that, um, thank you for your attention and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Peter. That was it was a expands like you said forty years. That's a lot of a lot of cool data. So I'm sure there are going to be questions. So <clears throat> please feel free to raise your hand, and I will call on you. Uh, it looks like Alessandro has a hey Peter. Uh, great, fantastic talk. And there was a, a, a number of things about your career that I was not aware of, especially your early work. That was like very similar to stuff that I did in my early work too, with some of SNS. And so that was very interesting. So this is more of a like a <clears throat> related to a talk, but not quite. Like, so you've been working in the biology of aging for uh, 40 years and you've seen, now you to say yourself coming out of the dark uh, recess of the, or the brown paper bag and coming out like into like, a well-developed field. What what are your predictions? What do you think? Where do you think we are going as a field? And if you want to, if you pref if you prefer to focus on cardiac aging alone because that's your specialty, not feel free to do that. Yeah. But if you want to comment in general, what do you think? Yeah, uh, thank you for Alexander, uh, Alexander for that. So so I mentioned that you know that obviously the the study gets more and more complicated on the molecular level just because the cell. Cell metabolism and regulation is really complicated. It is not, I like to say it is not an intelligent design. Evolution doesn't design things in an intelligent fashion. It cobbles things together in ways that randomly happen to work better. Um, so deciphering that is really complicated. So yeah, the, so the future I predict is going to be understanding increasingly sophisticated levels of complication. But the other thing that I failed, failed to mention that's sort of implicit with, with the fact that we, we, we started with what was really descriptive, went on to mechanistic, and you saw that we understand mechanisms, but I didn't stress the translational aspect. And this is really an exciting part of, of where the field of aging is going. Um, there was, prior to, to this century, that's say mainly in the last 10 years, there's an appreciation that that aging is, is something which can be modifi modified by pharmacologic interventions, including those that could be translational to people. And this has really been striking. And, I, and any of us working in the field recognize this sort of paradigm change, this, 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 this change with real momentum towards translational interventions that will, that will improve health span. And now the, the catchphrase here is health span because we're not really trying to make people live longer but better and healthier lives for a longer proportion of their lifespan. So the whole field has moved in this direction but it, with the perspective that I have from looking at it from 40 years or actually starting graduate work with George Martin that'd be 50 years. So half a century of work really in the last fifth of it we're starting to appreciate now that we can have a real effect in translation on improving health span. Uh, and obviously mitochondrial targeted interventions are just one, one way of doing this. Those of you who are aware of what's going on in the, in the field of aging probably know about things like senolytics, um, other drug treatments, uh, uh, other ways that, that uh, involve um, 
regenerative medicine uh, having effects uh, that will improve health span. So it's, it's an exciting time to be in the field. I'll be excited to more watch it than do it, but I expect great things to be coming in. And, and in fact, five years now turns out to be, a, 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 the field is moving quick enough, we'll see it in five. And in 10, I, you know, uh, I'll be old enough to maybe be able to benefit from some of these. People have asked me all along my career when I tell them I work in aging, they say, well, when are you gonna be able to do something that will help me before I get old? And, um, and, and maybe it may or may not be too late for me, I, you know, as long as you're still kicking, some of this work shows that there's a, there's a chance for interventions that will help. Uh, and I think that uh, 10 years will certainly be long enough for some of those to reach fruition. Uh, Nate. Oops. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Peter, incredible talk. Um, I mean, that was just, uh, a great tour de force through decades of amazing work that has really changed the way we think of, you know, um, how ROS and mitochondrial function contribute to aging. How can we treat diseases of aging, you know, such as um, treating them in old age, right? And not waiting, and, you know, not doing it at a young age, but doing it at an old age or, you know, persistent effects, right? Um, and a lot of un other and un unmentioned research you know, um, like uncovering the relationship between protein turnover and longevity, a lot of that work, <laughs> which you haven't even mentioned, uh, which has been really incredible. So uh, thank you for the talk. Um, it's funny what Alessandra just mentioned that you are doing these, some of these, this really early work you had done, uh, measuring um, EDU or BRDU incorporation and looking at senescence, because, you know, th that work was done before I was even born. And nowadays we're still using you know, I'm still using these assays to validate that cells are senescent to this day. So it's, it's really funny. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to say, I think I can say on behalf of all of us that um, while we're here, I just want to thank you for being such an incredible advocate and mentor and, su and supportive mentor to all of us. And um, I think that the, you know, the number of successful RAB labbers out there, not just the people on Zoom today, but you know, all of the ones who couldn't attend today is really a testament, you know, to to the legacy of your work. And um, you know, it's been it was a highlight of my research career to work with you. And you know, I wish you a long and happy uh, retirement that's free of uh, PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> so um, also before, um, you know, I actually I had a question about the future outlook of the field, but I I, I want to mention. Um, uh, I want to ask or request, if possible, that all the Rab Labbers at the end of this Zoom could please stay on the line because I'd like to uh, take a screenshot with all of us together. Um, uh, but Peter, yeah, I was going to ask you to speak on what do you think are the most inter interesting directions for people to pursue in terms of, um, you know, um, pursuing anti-aging interventions that target ROS and mitochondria? And do you think that there are other redox systems for example, outside the mitochondria that we might want to target going forward. Thanks, Nate. So before answering directly, I want to want to acknowledge the fact that that I showed a fraction of what Nate did and a fraction of of what uh, Mike McCoss has done. And, and part of that was indeed a really clever mechanisms of looking at protein turnover um, that uh, Mike McCoss came up with and, and Nate pursued. Uh, Nate was a graduate student in our in our the precursor to the MCB program, excuse me, the M3D program here, uh, went on to a great postdoc. Uh, in proteomics at the Buck, and and now is, has his own his own um, position in the intramural study program uh, as a, a principal investigator at the NIA. So um, it's been great to see that. And good job, Nate. Um, you know, I have a bias. Uh, obviously, I, I think in terms of redox. Um, that mitochondria are front and center. So mitochondria are both the major source of free radicals. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm biased to think that the signaling that is based on the combination of, of redox status and energetics uh, really is central. So that's my strong bias. So if you say, where, where, where would I look first? I would say, yeah, focus on, focus, focus on mitochondrial interventions if you're going to look at modifications of, of, redox and, um, of redox and energetics that can have profound effects on all of the organs that are very much dependent on this. Now that means kidney, heart, muscle, brain, all, everything that we think of as being important and declining with aging, those, those are on that list of things that are highly dependent on mitochondrial energetics. 
uh, and now and correlated that on redox. So, I, you know, that's my bias, Nate, is, is to still be enthusiastic about what can be done targeting mitochondria and, um, and Dave Marcinic and, uh, and Mariah Sweetwine and others have, a, have sort of a, a library to call on besides NMN and uh, SS31 for other agents that have been described as having effects on the electron transport chain uh, or on mitochondria. Um, and the, you know, mitochondria are also involved in, uh, in interactions um, with, um, with, with other components that are <clears throat> that in the, in, in the <clears throat> other components of that they're in close contact with the mitochondria, not just contractile apparatus, but lysosomal structures um, and uh, other aspects of signaling uh, that um, they're, they're closely related with. So yeah, you, that's where I'd put my money. If that answers your question, I'll, I'll stick with mitochondria. Uh, so for, yeah. for for the, um, the picture at the end, I'll have to transfer ownership to somebody, probably you, Peter. Um, so because otherwise, I'll if I leave, then everything will close. Um, that being said, uh, Jeff has a question. Yeah. I th thanks, Peter. Um, I, I'd also like to just take this opportunity since this was, uh, yes, this was your so long and thanks for all the fish moment. Uh, just to, to let everyone know here that um, uh, we're, we're losing a real uh, a hero of, uh, of sort of the department of DLMP. Uh, it isn't so often I, I, you know, I look at these things and I see how many uh, faculty have been around for 40 years. Um, and it, it's a real testament to your, to, your, to your strength. And I also would on it to uh, also like for all the folks who are here in DLMP to know just, I, I'm sure you suspect this, um, but the wisdom and compassion and humor that your vice chair brings to, uh, you know, the leadership of the department is noticeable and, and it really makes a difference. And if I had one regret of my time here in the department, it's that I only really got to know Peter uh, pretty much a couple of years ago. But th thank you so much for, uh, for, for your service and also for your friendship during, during this transition for the department. Now a question. Um, I'd like you to uh, s s uh, speculate a little bit. Let's say mitochondria are the end all, uh, you know, they, they are the cause and the factor, whatever, they're, they're, they're central to this. What does that imply in the macro sense? Um, do better performing mitochondria simply, uh, you know, reduce most causes of mortality? Uh, I've always wondered about aging, you know, what is the end game of anti-aging research? Is it to have people survive their heart attacks so they can go on to get demented later? Um, you know, what, what, without being fatalistic, what, what, what do you think the macro consequence is of, you know, causes of death and morbidity uh, if, if, in fact, mitochondrial approaches are going to be effective? Great, great question. Uh, thank you, first of all, Jeff, for your kind words. Uh, you know, I should have, when, when I had mentioned INDO-1, uh, right at the beginning of the talk of this sort of transformative ability to look at calcium modulation uh, in cells by flow cytometry, uh, Indo one is Jeff, so uh, that goes back to uh, Jeff. Actually, Jeff closer works. closer to the YFP uh, pH indicator that I have a lot. Yeah, that's true. Do. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, Roger Shen's lab, where where Jeff in his in his early days was a graduate student and and uh, shared in some of the glory of the Nobel Prize that went there. So um, I should also mention that in, in terms of vice chair function, uh, all of you should be reassured that uh, Cindy Durden, who will be here in July. Uh, is going to take on the reins with the same level of, of humor and and even more vigor than I've been able to give to it. So I, I feel very positive about that transition. Now, getting to your actual question, Jeff. Um, so first of all, it's been an underlying principle of work on, on aging that by, un, by targeting the underlying mechanisms of aging, one improves more than one organ system. That is to say, and, and the, the people, the the, the demographers who have looked at this, uh, Jay Oshansky, for example, um, have published this uh, and, and preached it extensively because it really is the case. If you target, the, if you target and, and, and cure uh, heart disease or uh, cure diabetes, um, then old age from other factors catches up with you and, you and the effect on improving either health span or lifespan is marginal. If you can, however, target the underlying age-related factors that give rise to increased susceptibility to heart disease, um, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and all of these, all of the chronic diseases of age, are, we call them of age because they uh, become important as time goes on and the aging process continues. If you fundamentally change that timing, that aging process, 
then it has the prospects for, for changing all of those at once. So that's the first answer, which is, you know, by doing this, you, and you saw this with, with MCAT, that it, it had effects on multiple systems. So the, the, the translational goal here is to affect multiple systems at, at once so that it has an improvement on an overall health span as opposed to any one given organ system, heart or any other. Having said that, it's unlikely that any one intervention, um, improving mitochondrial function, for example, will have um, a full effect. It's, each one of these is going to have, have, a, have some effect. And exactly what, what effect is needed, what combination of therapeutics are needed to, for instance, target senescent cells at the same time as mitochondrial energetics, or and maybe at the same time as, as improving regenerative capacity. Um, that remains to be seen, and that's part of where we're going to go in the future. You can imagine, and, and there are people who imagine, um, those, those who say you, uh, that maybe someday we'll live for an incredibly long period of time, do so by saying, well, we're going to, we're going to give a cocktail of, of things that target, target underlying mechanisms of mitochondrial um, senescence, um, regeneration. And, and maybe it's, it eventually will be a plethora of, of these, which in some cocktail are able to have the most profound effect. And so that's what the next 10 years will, will tell us is, is how much can, can a benefit can you get from, from which strategies and which combinations of strategies. Uh, I think that's gonna be an exciting thing to watch. Thanks. Any other? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're right at we're just past two thirty, so uh, you know if there's one last question, um, we can probably entertain it. Otherwise, uh, I will give my personal thanks uh, for, to Peter for for all his support. You know that I've been here since I came here for a postdoc uh, fourteen years ago, uh, and he's been there. You know as part of the aging training grant and, and throughout the whole thing, he's been a fa fantastic faculty mentor. Um, and so that's my personal thanks. And I'm sure that there are a lot of other people on the call that do the same thing. Um, I have given enough time for additional questions. So I think with that, uh, we just thank you for the talk. And, and well, let me uh, let me thank everyone. And uh, let me reassure everyone, I'm, I'm not actually going anywhere. You'll still be able to, uh, to get a hold of me now and for quite some time in the future at my email address. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not going to completely disappear, but thank you everybody for, for your attention and, and the, your kind words.